are for the first time to any of these Thai events. Okay. Good. Uh, hopefully this will not be the first uh, and the last as well, so you will come in for many more events. And how many people here are Thai members? All right. Okay. I've never seen that many members at one time, so that's good. Uh, and how many uh, people here are Thai Charter members? Okay, so for people who are new, uh, just want to kind of give you a quick 30-second uh, intro about Thai. Uh, Thai's sole aim is to foster entrepreneurship. And we do that by creating programs that inspire the entrepreneur in you. We do that by educating about the markets, about different things. We do that by helping you connect with people that can make a difference for you. And there are essentially three pillars on which Thai stands, and one of the pillars is the charter members. So these are people who are invited to become a member based on them having achieved some milestone in their life that is significant, and they are willing to help other uh, you know, budding entrepreneurs from the success that they have had. And we have about 250 or so charter members in the Silicon Valley area. And then we have you, the members, and you know some of you who are non-members here for the first time, uh, we would encourage you to become members. Uh, there are uh, programs, uh, and Naveen is going to talk a little bit about the programs, so there are programs that are only exclusively for members, and then obviously members get a discount to every event. So if you've already paid for two events, you basically paid for your membership, because the membership fee is only uh, 100 bucks a year. So if you want to become a member today, you can go outside and probably uh, you know, talk to one of the Thai staff members and they can help you uh, become a member. The third pillar of the organization is sponsors. So are there anybody here from the Thai sponsors? Well, thank you for being sponsors and we appreciate uh, you guys and all your help in uh, making all of our events successful. Uh, so with that, I'm going to invite Naveen to come in and talk a little bit about various programs uh, that we have before we get into today's program. Thank you. How about we give a big applause to Paul? <laughs> there is some more wine left outside, so in case you're you know, just already falling asleep, so that will get you started. Uh, so without taking too much time, as Paul was saying, um, that we, our whole mission is around fostering entrepreneurship. And so how we, uh, so all the programs are around that theme. So like we have this mobile segment. So have programs are industry sector specific, like we had energy event yesterday. In fact, I see some of the uh, folks here who were there yesterday as well. And so energy, mobile, social media, life sciences, and, um, uh, what else am I missing something I think? Uh, cloud, yes, cloud, how could we forget the cloud? So, and then we also have like Women's Growth Forum, um, uh, uh, the Growth Company Forum we had recently, we started a series of like, there will be four more programs on that, which is Startup Cookbook, and we had one, you know, one of the gentlemen who has written a book on entrepreneurship, he's been an entrepreneur, he gave a workshop, then after that we had a panel. So, and we'll be, so please uh, keep looking out for all these events, um, uh, on our website, tisv.org. So I'll just tell you quickly about some of the new programs we launched last um, year. So I've been chair for programs, so that means you know, I'm the volunteer, so just so we are always interested in having more volunteers here. In fact, I see some of the folks yesterday who were there, I told them to come today again, like Mr. Gary, sitting there from IBM, so he'll be our, another new volunteer. So please make sure, connect with uh, the, you know, our staff over here and myself or anyone. So, uh, the programs we launched last year was one of them was My Story program, which was in, launched in uh, March. And every month we have it on the first Tuesday, generally, unless there is a holiday, so we uh, switch it around. And then My Story is about, uh, you know, it's about an entrepreneur who has sold a company recently over $100 million plus or has taken it public, coming here and sharing his story or her story to see, you know, all the wisdom and lessons learned. So you can, because every, there is no, as you know, there is no, like, 
there is no simple formula that what once you start it's going to be successful as you know so uh, so that has been very successful in fact we have an upcoming event on july 10th founder of cloud.com in fact last year which was bought by citrix uh, sheng liang will be here to share that so please uh, those who are interested in this whole cloud and emerging technology uh, sign up for that and then so every month we have had this my story and in fact we have two more planned out for august and september in august we have atul bhatnagar from ixia he had taken the company it's, a, it's someone who's interested in how you grow the business and you know he turned it into a 500 million dollar company and billion dollar market cap so he's going to come and speak in september we have a gentleman who was founder of uh, recently funzio those who are into gaming it was bought by green so he's going to be here so those, that's on the my story then we have another new program we launched last year was thai uh, you start a pitch fest where you have a panel of venture capitalists here and you, you know they pick it's like kind of American Idol kind of a thing we wanted to call it in fact Thai Idol so they'll pick eight or nine uh, you know business cards and then you have to come and give your elevator pitch uh, for two minutes and they will give you all the you know good feedback and if they like one of them who is selected uh, will go directly in front of Thai Angels that's another program we launched a couple of years ago so every month we have this Thai Angels meeting here. It's a three-step process. Please go to our website. Again, it's um, for entrepreneurs who are looking for money. So how many of you are looking for money here? For the startups. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can see Paul is smiling. He wants. <laughs> so, okay. I want so, to know how much money you got in your pocket. I think I got five dollars in plastics. <laughs> so. Uh, so anyway, Thai Angels has been very successful. We launched it in August of 2010. So every month, uh, you can go to website. It's a three-step process, very nice. And then, uh, you know, you uh, log in there and put your information. Then eight companies are invited by a group of about 12 to 15 steering, uh, screening committee members who are ex venture capitalists and prolific angel investors, entrepreneurs. Then from there, they screen three companies. They present here every third Monday, third Monday of every month. So, and then you know, on an average, one company has been funded anywhere up to from, you know, sweet, star, sweet spot is 400 to 500K to $1 million. $1 million has been on the, I think that's on the high side. And a number of companies have got, gone on to um, uh, get venture investments, even, you know, firms like Excel Partners, etc. after that. So, it's, so all those who are looking for money, please go there. That's another program. We will also launch a new program. Now, it's uh, July. So it's called one-to-one -one with VC program. So that may, so we'll select about eight entrepreneurs who want to come directly, pitch uh, to the VC, uh, you know, 20 minute, and then from there whatever they can, you know, impress the VC. And if he wants to take it forward, you know, that's the basic idea. So we are launching that in July. We have got the confirmation from one VC, and we have two co-chairs: one Raj Golamudi, who is an investment director at Omidyar, and there is another gentleman, Kamal Anand, who is a senior VP at Meru Networks. So anyway, so as you can see, these all programs are designed around how do we continue to help entrepreneurs. So, and then the flagship program is Tycon. I think, um, and Paul probably didn't mention, forgot. Uh, Tycon is our flagship program, which is in May. Um, next year will be held in the middle of May. How many of you have been to a Tycon? Oh, great. So, so let me take a quick quiz before we <coughs> start quizzing our panelists. So how many, when was the first Tycon held? We don't have any older people here. <laughs> Sorry, 94. So, how many of you have been to uh, each and every Taikan? There is Sham. I have also been to everyone. I don't know. It just happened. It just seems like so. It's a great event. Very electrifying. Uh, very inspiring. Like three to four thousand people show up. We just had in middle of May this year. We'll have again middle of May next year. So, if you haven't, please do that. Uh, I would really encourage. In fact, in '96. Uh, you know, I was an entrepreneur looking like this. We didn't have any Thai angels, so I just by accident met my first angel investor for my company, Ukiah Software, which was bought within three years later by Nobel. So, like I said, these Thai events are very great. I look at it, just go there, meet people, and lead to something, you know, great for you. So, and also just to recognize Thaicon last year, Worth Magazine in October um, selected Thaicon as one of the top. 10 conferences in the world, along with World Economic Forum and TED, um, as uh, for ideas and entrepreneurship, which was a great accomplishment and kudos to 
the team. And you know, this whole conference is organized by about 400 volunteers who start working from January onwards. Because we have a very small staff, like Raj Desai, our new executive director, he just joined, uh, and before we had Kiran, she, uh, for the last four and a half years. And so she, he and there is a staff of three people, and the rest are all of us volunteers, including our panelists, our co-chairs, who give a lot of you know, their valuable time. So with that, anyway, I would like to introduce Nero Berry, who is our co-chair for mobile sector, along with Akas Agrawal, who couldn't be here today. Nirav is himself an entrepreneur, and I've, I've known him for over 20 plus years from UC Santa Barbara days. So I won't tell you that story here, but uh, so uh, the only thing I remember is Nirav, me, and two other friends. We were one day in room. We heard about Vinod Khosla, so it's kind of interesting, nothing big. But uh, we took a picture. We said we'll start a company, and uh, I think it just happened that all four of us went and started some company, and it was successful. So which is very interesting tidbit. And then Nero started a company called Cellmania. In fact, he was the first app store platform, which uh, researched in motion, he and his co-founder, and they sold it a few years ago. So right now, he's the world VP of uh, Vice President of Worldwide Payments and uh, Mobile Apps Operations. And then Akash Akrawal is another co-chair. He is a Senior Vice President at Location Labs, again, a uh, lot of experience in mobile. So like he's, you know, we try to get co-chairs who are very industry experts so they can entice all these great folks to be here. So with that, let me hand it over to Nero. Thank you. It's on. It's on. Thank you. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Naveen. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yes. OK. Uh, well, uh, I think we, we will have a very good panel today. Uh, we hope to uh, answer uh, questions you, you have coming in today about uh, what are the opportunities in mobile enterprise. Uh, it certainly seems to be an exciting area. Just get, you know, gathering from the audience here. Uh, we have a really good turnout. Uh, we have an excellent set of panelists, and uh, I'll shortly introduce them. Um, they're all, uh, I think each, uh, each and every one uh, is an entrepreneur on the panel, uh, leading uh, the major MDM, some of the leading MDM plays in the market today. Um, so I'll just quickly go through them and I'll introduce the, the topics on the panel uh, and, and uh, the, the gentlemen will go through their uh, backgrounds for a couple of minutes. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Wahid uh, Qureshi, uh, he is the co-founder and uh, CTO of Zenprise, uh, which uh, is one of the major Indian players. Uh, we have Ajay Mishra, uh, who is a co-founder and uh, chief customer officer uh, for Mobileye. Uh, we have Salil Jain, uh, who is uh, at SAP, uh, leading uh, some of their mobile initiatives. Uh, Manish Punjabi is uh, Senior Director at Brim, um, looking at uh, mobile collaboration and, and mobile solutions. And uh, Naeem Zafir, uh, at, uh, uh, also uh, actually an uh, educationalist, uh, a serial panel entrepreneur, and uh, uh, doing lots of interesting stuff. So let me just uh, quickly lay out the panel, and before we get into it, um, so we'll, we'll kind of, the way I look at mobile enterprises is, is three spaces. One is what's called mobile device management, uh, and these guys will all disagree with me, but mobile device management to me is, how does an enterprise manage all of these mobile devices? Androids, uh, iPhones, Blackberries, Windows devices. Uh, every enterprise has lots of them. How do they manage them? What happens when they get stolen? Uh, or people walk away with them? What happens to the data? So that's kind of one space. Another space is uh, mobile applications. Uh, how are enterprises building these applications? How are they deploying them? Uh, what kinds of applications are enterprises building? Right? So, so they're all mobile uh, enterprise platform as well as the applications. And then uh, security is another area, uh, which is how is all of this secure? Uh, and and Naeem is going to educate us uh, a lot about this. And um, as far as applications go, you know, we're going to talk about collaboration specifically. So uh, that's kind of the, 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 the general areas we'll explore. Uh, We'll start with a few questions, but really it's uh, open to the uh, to you guys to ask away. 
so we'll, I'll just quickly go, to, go through uh, each of the panelists and maybe they'll describe uh, what they're doing currently and you know what inspired them to start some of the companies that they did. So, uh, first of all, I'm so glad to be back at Thai. Uh, actually, I just met somebody and they said, well, he, we have not seen you for three years. Where were you? And I'm like, oh, well, we're busy executing, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I'm the, uh, I had the good fortune of starting the enterprise and, uh, you know, the one lesson that I can share with you is that when you start a company, you never know where you will end up. So when we started the Zen Prize, there was no iPhone, there was no Android, there was no iPad, uh, but there was, uh, you know, Blackberry, and, uh, you know, enterprises were starting to adopt mobile technology, so we, we started with that. Uh, but the problem that uh, existed, you know, five years ago that you had to solve, you know, with, for example, with the platforms at that time was a different problem. Uh, it was uh, it was basically a problem of service management, monitoring of of the end to end from the device all the way down to the apps that were pushing the data to those devices. But today, actually, you know what we call the MDM is has been redefined, and I would like to remind you that tomorrow is the fifth anniversary of. Can anybody tell me what? The iPhone. The iPhone. So in 2007, when the iPhone was launched, I think that was the same time that Ajay got inspired. And, you know, we also felt that, you know, that's going to be a very disruptive device. You know, when I saw it, and when I saw the user interface, you know, I said, this is the device that will create disruption. And since 2007, actually, a lot has happened, right? iPad, Android, um, and essentially a recognizing by all CIOs that they need to mobilize their business. So now let me very quickly tell you what Zenprise is focused on. You know, as a CTO of Zenprise, I also uh, don't look at us as an MDM vendor. We are not a mobile device you know, vendor. We are solving, the problem to be solved today is one of enterprise mobile computing. Because if you go to any CIO, you know, they like the devices, but they also have other problems, right? The devices themselves, then there is the issue of the applications, because without an application, there can be no ROI, because you cannot get any useful data to the device. Then there is the issue of the connectivity between the device, because remember, the device is a device that is not in your control. It is somewhere out there. So how do you securely connect on that network? And finally, there is the issue of data. How do you actually get the data to the device, and then how do you secure it, and how do you manage it? So what Zenprise is focused on is that we are all about providing management and security to all of these four dimensions, namely the device, applications, the network, and the data. So that's what we are focusing on. Thank you. Thanks. So again, my name is Ajay Mishra, and I got in mobility because I was looking for someone to pay my $43,000 tuition for business school. <laughs> so that was Motorola Mobility before Motorola Mobility got started. I was in Chicago, needed $43,000 tuition. They paid my tuition, I worked for them, moved to BK program. Um, so um, from there, I moved to Bay Area, um, tried to learn the valley like the Bay Area, during the dot com time. I, I did come from dot com background, so I learned the valley. 2001, and the first business cycle started, which was the Wi Fi was shipping in boat loads from Taiwan and they were going to come from every direction inside the enterprise and the CIOs had to run their business and secure and manage. So that was the first business cycle. I started a company in airspace and that company, uh, Cisco bought it for $450 million in 2005. 2007, after two years at Cisco, I left again and this time I saw the smartphones coming in boat loads. They're going to become the computer of the future and CIOs have to manage, secure and run their business. And I say, hey, they need a platform, then I've seen the movie. So, so that was the genesis of Mobile Island. And that's my second company. Um, so what, what Mobile Island does is really about the first thing that we do three or four things. First of them is make sure that uh, we give a, basically we give a platform to CIOs to make sure secure and manage the, the three and the, the devices which are coming in the enterprise. There's always room for three operating systems. You know, it's in the window in the laptop world, there's an operating system, you got Windows Mobile, you got, not Windows Mobile, you got, you got Mac, you got Windows, and then you got Linux. 
in the in the mobile world, there's always room for three operating systems. And we're going to support all three. And that's what we do right now. It's uh, three are uh, iOS, Android, and possibly Windows 8. Uh, so that's how we look at and we look at the market. So, so securing and managing an after that we are running the business, and that means application and content. And so that's what we do. We we get the best that from the enterprise. You got the third uh, raise us the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> I just listen to my customers. <laughs> Salil Jain and I work for SAP, um, one of the larger software companies around. Uh, our uh, uh, mobile practice uh, really started about a couple of years ago, so that's what uh, I've been participating in. And my role in the company is to help our field organization uh, adopt mobility, sell mobility, get our customers to adopt mobility. And um, about about two two and a half years ago, SAP. Internally realized that uh, uh, mobility was a major trend that we could participate in and add a lot of value to our customers. Uh, we made a major commitment there um, to, to grow that business, uh, acquired Sybase, which had a number of interesting properties uh, from a mobility perspective, uh, primarily a device management solution and a applications development platform. Uh, that formed the basis of our offering to the market and uh, We've since gone on to acquire some additional application uh, vendors. We've uh, built a lot of applications organically using our platform. And so today we offer what we consider a comprehensive solution for mobility for our customers. And that includes the device management. We look at it, it's the uh, applications development platform, both for uh, B2B or business to employee applications as well as B2C or business to applications and the applications themselves. I think uh, uh, just as we have seen the explosion of applications in the consumer world, we believe that that's going to eventually uh, be there in the uh, enterprise world as well. So there's a ton of opportunity, we believe, for us to go develop those applications ourselves. Um, as, a, as a starting point, we believe uh, mm -hmm. a lot of our, almost all of our applications that we today offer on-premise mode will eventually be uh, delivered through uh, mobile devices and in a fairly short time frame. So we believe there's a lot of opportunity in this particular space and uh, we're pretty committed to the uh, offering here uh, for, uh, you know, for our customers. And um, uh, I've been with SAP for, uh, for about eight years uh, in the mobile space in the last two or three. A couple of uh, other enterprise companies and consulting companies stops on the way um, at uh, smaller uh, entrepreneurial uh, uh, ventures, uh, but um, much more so now focused on what I consider and, uh, uh, a startup within a very large company as we grow our mobile business and uh, take our uh, offering to the market. Uh, hi everybody, my name is Manish Punjabi. I work for that third provincial oils company that we just alluded to. I, I manage the communication and collaboration portfolio at RIM, and uh, specifically that includes applications in voice messaging. I've managed uh, IM, enterprise consumer, uh, and, and uh, conferencing, audio, web, video, and there's certainly mobile opportunities in all of those areas as we speak, and, uh, and, and even collaborative applications like SharePoint. Uh, I've been at RIM for about three years now, and prior to that, I've also spent a lot of time in other communication collaboration type roles. And then I've also been an entrepreneur in the past, and I hope to do it again. Uh, with respect to RIM, you know, obviously it was in the news today. If you heard, they had an uh, earnings uh, announcement today. And again, it's, uh, I think we've quickly forgotten where Apple was in 97 when Steve Jobs came back, and they were hurting too. Uh, you know, obviously RIM is a t in a tight spot, there's no s secret about it, but on the flip side, they do have a strong uh, install base of 78 million plus uh, active subscribers. Applications like BBM have 56 plus million active subscribers, so they've got some good valuable assets. They've got a lot of credibility in the enterprise with respect to management and security and several areas which are actually still evolving and emerging as far as mobile goes. So, 
like all companies, they have not obviously given up and are trying to make a comeback. And uh, there's some good assets to build upon. Certainly, the world changed, and, and you know, as our um, uh, as my fellow panelists have indicated, I mean, timing is critical. And so there was, I still remember in 03 or 04 when the first wave of mobile companies existed, even Open Dave, if you remember them, and they always pondered what was that killer app on mobile. And you know, clearly, HP Jobs proved uh, there was no single killer app, but there were a collection of apps that changed the face of mobile. So, but again, I still believe where mobile is today and the set of applications and ecosystem that's emerging around mobile is still the first generation of mobile and when I compare it to other industries like uh, social networking or search, it's things that are fairly recent and evolving. They've all gone through multiple iterations too. There was first wave of search vendors and second wave of search vendors and there was similarly first and second wave of social networks. So, so likewise I expect it's still early in the mobile world and so there's certainly a lot of opportunity for entrepreneurs like you guys. I'll hand it so, uh, my name is Naeem Zafar, and uh, my moderator may not have mentioned it, but I'm the co-founder and CEO of Bitsum Mobile. So, Bitsum Mobile is different in many ways than the companies who are the panel here. I mean, one thing, we are the youngest startup, two and a half years old, and we also look at the market differently. So, my own background is I'm a serial entrepreneur, Silicon Valley, 22 years, uh, six startups, one IPO, several mergers, acquisition, things like that. And I've been also teach uh, entrepreneurship at UC Berkeley. But I've been uh, very involved with Thai, but mostly I'm on the podium. It's the first time I'm sitting on a panel in my 15 years involvement with Thai, which is, seems very hard. <laughs> Normally I'm moderating. But uh, we're different in many ways. One of them, we are youngest. So if you remember all those Friendster, and there was this MySpace, and there were a bunch of companies, and then came Facebook, and the rest is history because we don't have our roots in the long history and multiple pivots like you heard from some of the panelists. We started in this generation. So our view is different. When we don't think of the market as MDM, device management, and application. That's not how a user looks at the market. A user does not have an MDM problem. A user does not have an application problem. A user has two problems. He needs secure access to corporate intranet, and he wants to be able to run the same application the same way he was running on his laptop, sitting in his office. That's his problem. That's what we solve. So our approach is completely different. It's about secure access, Windows, in the most integrated solution with Windows authentication backend, single sign-on, same experience as if you're sitting at your desk with all the enterprise grade security. It's a secure container-based approach. You download a container on your mobile device, all your corporate stuff is isolated in the container. All your personal fun stuff is outside the container. You don't have to put a four-digit, six-digit pin to get to the, your Facebook. But when you log into your container, knock yourself out. We support smart cards. We support same authentication which you do today. So it's a very different approach. And you'll, hopefully, you'll see more of that in your interaction that you have to look at the market differently with the second generation players who don't have arrows on their back. Uh, so I'll, I'll just start off with a couple of questions and uh, we'll open up to the floor. Um, uh, so what, you know, we have uh, quite a good representation of companies here. What do you guys see as the, the top, let's say, one or two problems that your customers are trying to solve? So, so we have two kind of customers. There's a, the customer who's just getting into the they want to just say mobile, more. they want to say yes to mobile, the new generation of platform. So they actually just want to know how they are secure, how do you do bring your device, all the process, procedure, makes, making sure the door is there. You know, you can secure and manage. So that's the first. The, most of the customers who are the older customer, like more than a year or six months old, they actually are you know, all focusing on how do I run my business. And that's all about application and content and delighting my users. So that's, uh, those are the two, uh, two group I see, and uh, almost, uh, I say, 90% of the first year customers are now more into application, that's the, the, that's the immediate problem, and the content. More so than the device. That's correct. Device, they understand for six months. If they don't understand device, they're not going to let it go beyond POC or maybe a very select group of users. So now we, we have like 60, 70, I mean, 
And in 67 you have their users already have the devices, now they're thinking about how do I make productive run their business, it's all about application and content. Sure. Uh, so so in, in many ways, very similar to, to that view, what we do tell our customers is, um, you know, the, the starting point is always securing their devices. Um, we also see, though, a lot of lines of business, you know, executives that just need a solution to their problem in their, whether it's, uh, you know, field service, or it's uh, sales, or whatever else. Sponsoring applications first, and then IT, then reacting, and trying to make sure that they've got a, uh, a good process and tools for uh, securing the devices and managing the devices. Um, so we see uh, customers starting at both points, though we, in generally, we, in general, we agree that um, a, a good point to, to start is securing the devices and then moving on to the applications relatively quickly. Um, that add business value. So let me answer your question uh, slightly differently. Like, what problem people are trying to solve? Because I want you to see, can you relate to use cases? Imagine a doctor who belongs to a couple of clinics in a hospital. He's flipping back and forth in a busy day, doing a surgery, waiting to the next place. He's getting messages from his nurse that what to do about Mrs. Johnson, she's waiting to be discharged. Could you look at the lab result and say, okay, what does he have to do today? He has to find a laptop. He has to fire up the laptop, set up a secure VPN session. Only then he can read the messages because they are HIPAA compliant, so you can't just send them open text. Then he can look at the lab report. In the meantime, Mrs. Johnson is waiting in the lobby for two and a half hours. All of us have done that. We have a doctor is not here yet. Fact is now, right now with our solution, those doctors are accessing those record and secure messages on the platform, Android or iOS. By the way, we support all four. Blackberry, very important. I will never discover that. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, damn it, Blackberry wins. They, they have master security. Never met a guy who questioned their security. Um, we are total believers. So four, four platform. So this is Mrs. Johnson can get the if insurance agent out in the field. Right now he goes in the meets a customer, takes down a bunch of information with Mrs. and Mrs. whoever, comes back to the office, types it up, looks up the rate sheet, sends a proposal four days later, they don't remember who, who came to see them. The new model is you whip out your iPad, right there you enter the information, you have all the rate sheet, you have a quotation, you sign on the iPad, you're done. That's what mobility is about. It's about letting people do things which they cannot do today. Is enabling the mobile workforce and get a lot more productive out of it. You got to enable the infrastructure. That's what we do. So I, I think there, there's clearly two parts to it. One is you know doing the same thing that they did on a laptop and you know doing it on a mobile device. But I think that's a small segment of what they can do because a mobile device is essentially a different form factor. And you know the, the location and capabilities, the other device capabilities that you have allow you to really transform your business process at least from an perspective and do things very differently from what we used to do earlier. So the insurance agent didn't necessarily have a camera capability and, and things like that on the, on the laptop. So we think there is a tremendous opportunity to go rethink everything that people did on their desktop and do it in a very much more simple way, do it in a much more streamlined way, do it in a much faster way. And, and that creates a tremendous opportunity for, for everyone to go out there and create an application. Yeah, and if I can just jump in. Actually, it's interesting that what we see when we go into, into an enterprise is that there are two things going on. The first thing is that there is this, all of you have heard this term called BYOD. So what has happened in the last three years? Yeah, that is bring your own device. So companies are now saying to employees, okay, if you bring in your own device, I'll let you get email on it and I might as well give you access to the corporate SharePoint but you have to agree to some terms and conditions to, 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 to do that. So going back, so when we go into, when we go call into a customer, they are facing two issues. A BYOD issue, generally, and then there is a general line of business issue where you know, some very uh, clever line of business guys, they have all these apps, but uh, you know, they have great ideas, but now they are trying to figure out how to deliver these apps to the corporate device which previously used to be BlackBerry, but now there is a new push to maybe get new kinds of devices, right? Uh, so I, I think those are the two very important things that we see. And then just to add to what you said, I think before you get to solving um, what I call uh, 
a optimized uh, business, you know, that is totally mobilized, I think CIOs still have to solve some very important problems that are around security, around compliance, uh, because they are on the hook, especially, you know, you mentioned the, uh, the medical area, right? So there are so many uh, standards and regulations that someone is going to get in deep trouble if they don't cover, cover their bases. And actually, uh, there are so many interesting use cases that I can think of because the mobile device is actually an interesting device. It has location, right? Uh, so how many of you go to restaurants and you've seen people giving you those little ugly red uh, beepers, right? And you know the things that buzz? So we have a customer, again, by the way, I cannot tell you name of any of our customers because I was told by my marketing guy not to say any name. <laughs> but they actually got rid of, um, you know, those and uh, they basically, when you go in, they will, they will text you. They'll say, what's your phone? And they immediately will enroll you and they'll send you a text. Secondly, what they are doing is that they are giving their chefs, you know, they are downloading all of their recipes onto an iPad, which, the, you know, which some of the employees have in the, in the restaurant. And then they use this, this, you know, a new capability, which is around location, that they draw a little uh, circle around the restaurant, and if that device ever goes out, you know, the device gets actually, uh, it, 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 it automatically gets wiped. That's something we call geofencing. So you can fence the device. So I think there are some very interesting use cases that what I call, there are 2% of corporations out there today who are very forward thinking and they are, they are basically betting on mobile, they are mobilizing their business and then if you go down you know, the, you know, that, stair, you know that staircase, you'll see people who are just doing what Ajay mentioned, they've just got a mobile solution and they're just trying to you know, get going but there are some really great use cases that I have seen. I'll, I'll actually share with you one more use case which is again very interesting. Um, you know, a very large, um, you know, company that makes uh, aerospace equipment, you know, they basically do not ship manuals anymore. They do ship the manual, but now the manual is actually on a very shiny device that goes in the, in the whatever device they make, right? And that continuously gets, gets updated. So there is no issue of ever of a of of you know uh, of a pilot or 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 somebody who's trying to maintain that that device uh, you know that 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 vehicle ever getting the older documents because they're consistently and constantly being updated, which was not possible you know with some of the older use cases. So I, I think there's there's a lot of things happening in this space that are interesting. Great. Well, why don't we uh, open it up to the audience? Uh, You know, any different? What are you seeing the adoption with respect to those tablets with your mobile strategy? So, absolutely. I think the game changer was the iPad. When enterprise got hold of iPad, they just that changed the game. And the strongest adoption we have seen of those devices is happening worldwide. So, we have the strategy. We absolutely support tablet and phones both. Smartphone. We think there's a huge opportunity with how enterprise will use tablets, and it will change. Very excited about what's coming down the pike, also. But remember, the, the thing which it keeps mentioned on the panel is, and there's a, it's by the way, not coincidental that I'm sitting as far away from the MDM guys. <laughs> we are anti-MDM. It's not, guys. It's not about the device. Get over it yourself. It's about the data. It's not about mobile device management. It's mobile container management. Mobile data management. Is security and access to the data. Because nothing annoys a user more, app ad user. Every time you wanna be driving, you wanna check your email or a message, you gotta put in the eight digit pin. And like the example said, you move out of the geofence area, it wipes the whole device. Excuse me, my dog died last year, it was four dollars on the phone, don't wipe a device. <laughs> it's not about the device. By the way, don't misquote me. <laughs> So, just to be clear, if the device was, well in this case, it's a corporate owned device. But the notion of a geofence is that if, if it's a BYOD strategy where you brought your own device and you're getting corporate data, you know, we also have, you know, the containerization approach. So in that case, what happens is that only the corporate data gets wiped very cleanly. 
In fact, the day you know the, the, the day you leave a business, actually, it's very simple. It gets pushed, and you you leave with a clean device. But obviously, if it's a corporate device. Give your phone out, and none of the corporate apps are there in your file. No. <laughs> well, of course, that's a good indication. But but the key is that it's very selective. Yeah, I was just going to comment on the question. I mean, the, oh, the reality is, you know, while they are both mobile devices, the tablet and the smartphone, there's certainly common use cases to both. But the tablet, because of a different form factor, enables a different class of use cases and a different class of applications. As an example, and since you know we are talking about enterprise mobile, something like business intelligence. I mean, you could look at a business intelligence report on a smartphone, but the tablet is certainly a better browsing form factor. And, and especially with all the advances going into that. So I think ultimately both will yield actually a new class of apps. And I think that's where there's a lot of opportunity because a lot of what has occurred so far is porting your existing app on desktop to mobile. And in fact, when I talked to IT uh, execs too, in fact, we had a real conference four or five weeks ago and I talked to a lot of the major Wall Street banks and I asked them roughly the same set of questions. And while everybody talks about BYOD, what I gathered was that firstly, a lot of these big banks haven't quite yet formally endorsed BYOD. Because BYOD is kind of a double-edged sword, so they have to go through appropriate due diligence to get there. They're also going through a rationalization process of determining, determining which apps need to be mobile. And which apps need to be mobilized for the tablet form factor versus which apps need to be mobilized for the smartphone form factor. And I think the forward-looking enterprises, and there's certainly some of them that are way ahead of the curve. I had a voice-over Wi-Fi product at Rim, and uh, there's one very notable large bank on Wall Street that was adopting it well before others were even thinking about it. So it's just the way they operate, and they look at mobile as an opportunity to gain a competitive advantage from a competitor in their space. So it's not just, I have to do this because everybody else is doing it. I need to do it to gain a competitive advantage over others in my space. I just add to the request. So I came from Motorola very early days. The phone has to fit in your front pocket, and it needs to touch your ear and your mouth. Otherwise, it's not known as an accepted. So most customers, uh, you know, in my case, it's 1.5 devices they have. One which fits here, other one they carry, which is either you call a tablet or so that's what that's how we're seeing it, and depending on what they're doing, they are either using this or they're using the other use system. Do you have them in the pipeline? Yeah, the user they want to access the file interface information, and the CIOs they want to make sure they secure the narrative. So, so yes, we have to use because that's what user wants, and you don't want them to have two different look and feel and two different. I just the only thing I'll add on top of that, that unified strategy doesn't mean that we don't do everything we do that we give, we give the user the native experience. So we don't containerize them so they hijack their user experience. We want to make sure that anything we do, we always deliver the solution by just making sure that they, they buy this to make sure they to have a lot of apps and not to, not to put everything in container. So everything we deliver, make sure that they we do not hijack their experience and we continue to let them have the same experience, which is very, very important. So I know that BYOD, BYOD has become a big buzz, uh, but come on, realistically, you expect that the companies will spend $1,000 to secure a device that costs $400. So why not just buy a separate damn device, which they've always bought for you know, laptops. So why not again? Why is it a big deal? I mean, in laptops, people talk about BYOD for 10 years, it never happened. Why for a $400 or $200 device? Doesn't make any sense. Well, do people want to carry two devices? Yeah. They want to carry two devices from a laptop perspective. One at home and one. Well, there's, there's people saying that there's, there might be BYOD, BYOD for, you know, for laptops. Some companies. People go in and say, I'm for this. We've talked about it for 15 yeah. years. So let's see what these look for analysts to talk about. Yeah, what do you guys say? If we can 
find a customer who's willing to pay a thousand bucks a device, I'd like to. You guys all have to get paid, right? All the gizmos that have to be attached to secure the devices that are cost you in the end, in management and everything else over there, it will be that much. We'd love to find those customers. It will be more than the value of device. Actually, I think in your, there's, I think actually there's one flaw in the argument. Uh, you're talking about a $400 device. The cost of the device is just the initial point. Then you have to value the cost of maintaining a service on the device for the enterprise. So what the enterprises are doing, so if you look at the lifetime cost of the device, just like your LTV model for a device, then it's much more expensive. Now, and that's one hand. The other part is your cost of $1,000 in securing the device. I don't know any mobile security solution out there that actually costs that much. Because, and this may not have come across completely, but what the enterprises are trying to do to secure BYOD, and again, the jury's still out which approach will win, and these guys are experts too, is that they are trying to have their enterprise workspace at BlackBerry, we call it BlackBerry Balance or our work perimeter on the device. That's a part of your device that I control. And I will uh, push enterprise apps, mandatory apps, optional apps to that workspace. The day you leave, I wipe out that workspace because that's all I own. And for allowing you to use your personal device for the enterprise, I will likely choose to subsidize that. So if you look at the cost of that for the enterprise, it's still way better than just funding the whole device. And employees use the device for personal calls, and there's so much other activity that goes on on the device. I actually have always wondered, you know, there's almost something about the mobile market and the way it exploded that almost required a BYOD model or the enterprises to adopt a BYOD model compared to the laptop, which as mobile as we consider the laptop, it's not been anywhere as mobile as a smartphone or a tablet. So, actually, so, um, you know, the way I look at it is a lot of the adoption in mobile has been a lot of convenience. Um, because fundamentally, you can take a laptop, walk around, put it up anywhere, and, you know, do what you need to do. You can connect and, and, and transact your business. The, the, the mobile device has just made it a whole lot more convenient for you to do that. You just kind of fire it up, and it's, you know, it's, the, it's, it's a few seconds, you're in your application, you're able to transact your business and you want, whether it's email, whether it's an application, etc. And the reason for BYOD in many ways is because <coughs> what people don't want are two different uh, devices because that takes away from the convenience factor. So it really does away with a lot of the benefits and that, uh, that really is driving a mobile. So in, in, in that sense, that BYOD is there to stay, it'll manifest itself in, di in different ways. Um, yeah, but I think it's 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 clear and it's gonna go, gonna go forward. One interesting point about BYOD is I don't think the enterprises came up with it. It was sort of for thrust upon them. Right? You're absolutely right. I mean, this whole thing has called consumerization of the IT. There was a revolt in the consumers who realized that it doesn't have to be like DOS. It could be fun. It could be icon and very intuitive thing, and I, iPhone really corrupted all of us. Yeah, see, so they're revolt. Yeah, so the BYOD, the most important answer of BYOD is user experience. And that's why carrying two devices and isolating this you know, mobile device management and thing kills the UX. The adoption is because of user experience is so poor. Cool. So till you, from ground up, architect a solution <coughs> with user experience in mind, BYOD doesn't work. So it's about providing the right UX. And your economics argument is right. If you look at the uh, user experience, and if, if you look at the argument, it's correct. The ownership, but is the issue. One year, a BlackBerry or an iPad provided by the enterprise, the cost is about twelve hundred to two thousand dollars between the connection charges, the IT overhead, and whatnot. But companies are doing it. Bring your own iPad, and we'll give you forty dollars a month subsidy. They also disassociate from them from the legal obligation. What else were you doing on the device? So it's a legal consideration why BYOD does make sense. There's an economic argument and there's a user experience argument. So it's a tsunami you can't avoid. Embrace it. So, <laughs> so I'm going to change the subject a bit. Yeah. I'm Naren Bakshi. I'm one of those few people that are living in India and US for a long time. So one broad question that I would like all of you to think about is, we're talking about enterprise, we're talking about all this. What about 2 billion, 3 billion bottom of the pyramid people that are loving 
moment. And things are evolving faster than anybody had ever imagined, even in a place like India. I mean, uh, kinds of application that I go and see there, in villages, in rickshawalas places, I mean, it is just absolutely mind-boggling. So can you all comment as to when you're thinking of next generation, what are you thinking about those two, three billion mobile phones? So uh, it's a very good question, actually. And uh, you know, we have well, customers worldwide, including in again, I'm not, I can't mention countries, but we have customers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, it's very interesting that you know, in the emerging market, there's a lot of apps being developed for doing, you know, money transfer. Now, if you think about money transfer, it's actually, it is a trust problem, it's a security problem, uh, and things like that. So, as I mentioned before, you know, there are these small apps that people are using in these markets to, you know, to, uh, to do very great things, you know. Uh, and, and I think what, what, for example, what we, what we are doing, actually we have customers in those areas, that carriers, we actually deploy our solution, and they use actually a lot of their traffic is um, is based on this, you know, person to person text messages that are actually transferring. Uh, there's there's money being transferred, right?